No drawing room was ever as brilliantly lit as the whole city that night. As flames burst through the roof of the capital, there was a roll of thunder. At about 10.30 p.m., the men move on to another key government target, the White House. In the dining room, they find the table set. Coburn orders wine poured, and in a sarcastic toast to the president, drinks to Jemmy's health. Soldiers rampage through the rooms, grabbing souvenirs, including a ceremonial sword and a pair of rhinestone buckles. Even Major General Ross pockets President Madison's love letters to Dolly. Outside the mansion, the Redcoats pitch their torches through the windows, engulfing the White House in flames. The destruction of Washington's public buildings, these fires, the glow of which was seen 50 miles away, struck at the hearts of many Americans wherever they were. Every American heart is bursting with shame and indignation at the catastrophe, recalls George Douglas, a militia private. Perhaps no one feels the emotions more deeply than President Madison, who watches the fires from horseback in Virginia. There's no sign of panic. There was intense concern about making sure the government didn't fold up, and he felt, a, of course, a responsibility. At that stage, Madison was thinking, where would he find Dolly? Where would the rest of the government be? How could he reconvene them to show that the government could still function and still exist in an effective form? The next morning, August 25th, the British set the Library of Congress and the Navy Yard afire as storm clouds threaten overhead. But at two o'clock that afternoon, two events would transform a burning Washington into a scene beyond comprehension. With little warning, one of the most powerful hurricanes in its history hits Washington. Lightning splits clouds open as gale force winds tear through the city. Out of nowhere comes this uncanny storm, which not only dumps a tremendous torrential downpour, but it rages against this British column. One redcoat recalls the fury of this perfect storm. Our column was completely dispersed, as if it had received a total defeat. Some of the men flying for shelter behind walls and buildings, and others falling flat upon the ground to prevent themselves from being carried away. Such was the violence of the wind that two pieces of cannon were fairly lifted from the ground and borne several yards away. What has started out as a blessing is about to become a catastrophic event of epic proportions. As the hurricane wreaks destruction throughout the burning city, a tornado suddenly appears from the sky and shears through the center of the capital. For two hours, the immense storm rages through Washington, dousing most of the flames that have turned the capital into an inferno. We now know a tornado actually touches down like the wrathful hand of God from the Old Testament and inflicts more casualties in the middle of that British column than they even suffered in Bladensburg. When the storm clears out the next day, so do the British. The invasion force returns to Benedict, Maryland, a battered and bewildered unit.